Hi, I'm Sabin Yaakov. This presentation is entitled Deep Dive into the Discrete Design of a Static Charge Pump High Sight Gate Driver. Now, the circuit we are talking about is a driver for a transistor, which is a high side transistor, and in which case we don't want a galvanic connection between the command side and the actual power side. So the intention here is to have a gate driver that can handle this potential difference. Now this difference could be a voltage difference, that is a, that this is riding on a high voltage, or it could be a capacitive connection between the two grounds. It should be pointed out that in this approach that I am showing, there must be an AC impedance between this side and this side. That is, for an AC signal, there must be a path. So I'll talk about it a little bit later, uh, just to stress this further. So we are talking about a gate driver that, for example, can drive a transistor, high side transistor, and here we have the load. Now we want a static drive. That is, we are not talking about a PWM high frequency uh, switching here, but rather turning it on and off at a lower switching rate or in a DC situation. So we want this to be a constant voltage here. Now it should be pointed out that this approach is really not suitable for high switching frequency because the rise and fall times are rather slow, so the switching losses will be high. So this is suitable for a static situation or like once in a while turning it on and off like a solenoid, like a pre-charge of capacitors that you need to turn on the transistor. So here is the basic design of what you might call the charge pump, a DC restorer also will be the right name for it, or a switch capacitor converter, in which case we are talking about a unity gain here. So here is the principle of operation we are talking about. We have pulses coming in, and then we have, when the pulse is high, we have a charging of the output, and here we see, this is V in, this is the voltage here going up. Here we see the current through the capacitor. And then we see the voltage across the capacitor, which is being charged. And then eventually we see the output voltage here, which is charging. And then as the pulse is going down, we have a discharge of this capacitor through this diode. Here is the current of the discharge. So we see the capacitor voltage, the switching capacitor or the flying capacitor as it is called, the voltage on it is going down. And then at the output, which is now fed from the holding capacitor, we also see the voltage going down. So this is the typical operation of a charge pump or you might call it this restorer or a switch capacitor converter. Now this circuit can work okay if there is a DC offset between this side here and here, this voltage difference will be carried by the capacitor. So the capacitor now, here we see it, has now a, is the signals are riding on this potential difference, that is this uh, V sub B is now actually imposed on this capacitor. So this capacitor has uh, to withstand the voltage difference between these two sides, these two grounds that you can call them. Now, as I have said, you must have a AC path because if there's no AC path here, this circuit cannot work. There's no closure of the current. I mean, the current can, cannot flow. So you must have an AC path. Now here, it's okay because this uh, voltage source can carry AC too. There's no problem in that. But if we'll have here a high impedance, then this circuit actually cannot work. It is important to realize that charging and discharging of capacitor can take one of three forms. If the duration of the on time is long, then this charging is coming to completion. If the duration is very short, we are actually here at, at this very beginning, then we'll see almost a constant current. We call it no charge and here we call it complete charge. 
And of course, there is an in-between situation in which the charging or discharging is not completed and terminated at a given point. So this is the basic of charging and discharging of a capacitor. Now, why is it important? It is important because it is affecting the internal resistance of this circuit. That is, we can represent this charge pump or switch capacitor or converter as a voltage source, which is the open circuit voltage, we call it the target voltage, and then an internal resistance. This internal resistance depends on the situation we are at. And here is the summary that we can see it here. This is the log of this resistance, the equivalent resistance. This is now the switching frequency. And what we see is the following, that at the beginning, we see sort of a one over behavior, one over switching frequency times C, and it goes down until it hits this line here, which is proportional to the total resistance in the circuit, okay? That is the total resistance in the actual circuit that you have here. So here it is frequency dependent because we are at this region, and here it is almost constant because we are already in this situation, and what is really affecting the circuit is this resistance. Now, all this is very important if you are passing a lot of power, it's like a power converter, and we are worried about efficiency. In this particular case, this is not a big issue because the power we are delivering is very small, so we are not too much worried about the efficiency here, and therefore, there is no problem that we will work with relatively large RE, especially since the currents are very small. I mean, relatively small. So here is an example. <clears throat> so here is a demo example. What we have here is a pulse generator that is turned on and off. We have the flying capacitor for the charge pump. We have a resistor in series, so I'll talk about it a little bit later that I, we are adding here. And then we have the two diodes and a RC circuit. This is a bleeder resistor, so as not to leave the gate open when there is no feeding of a signal. And there is a capacitor also for holding the voltage. Although there is a input capacitance to the gate, I'll first only consider an RC circuit here without the transistor, or later on we'll add the transistor. So in this case, we have a hundred volt between this side and the, the ground of the pulse generator, of the input signal. And then this unit is fed from a current source. And then we have a clamping voltage such that when the gate here is zero, the current is going here through this uh, clamp. So when the gate voltage is say 12 volt, then of course the current will be passing through the transistor and this diode will be blocked uh, by say 50 volt, which is the difference between 150 and 100. Now, as for the bleeder, this is just a choice uh, that we have to make. So I don't want to leave the gate open and I guess 100 kilo ohm will be okay. If the environment is noisy, perhaps you'd like to go to a lower value, but let's stick with this value now. So the first thing to do is to have a look at the currents that we are expecting here. So first of all, what will be the current through this RG? This is 15, say 15 volt uh, gate voltage over 100K, it's so a 0.15 milliamp. And then the question is, what is the required current that to be fed here. Now, I'm assuming that this eventually is going to be a transistor, and let's just assume that the total capacitance will be 100 nanofarad, and let's say that I am satisfied with a rise time of 100 microsecond. 
which is okay if we are talking about a once in a while turn on and turn off. And this brings us to a current of about 15 milliamp. These are just for getting a sense of what type of currents we are talking about. Now, obviously, if I want uh, this uh, timing to be shorter, then the current will be higher, which is okay. Now, if we are talking about this type of current, 0.15 and 15 milliamp, or even 100 milliamp, if you want the, the rise time to be faster, then it would appear that the internal resistance or output resistance of this charge pump of 1K will do the trick. We don't need more or a lower resistance than that. And if we are working in the complete charge region with a small capacitor, then with a 100 kilohertz of uh, switching, assuming a 100 kilohertz, we find out that we need a capacitance of 10 nanofarad. This is this, this is this flying capacitor. Now what about this uh, resistor that I've added? The point is that without this resistor, this peak currents are going to be very high because we are uh, at the beginning, say, charging this capacitor toward a capacitance which is zero volts. And also when there is a ripple here, and as we charge it, we're going to see high peak current. So adding a resistor, which is not too large, of course, we lower these peak currents. And if it is like 100 or 120 ohm, it will not affect the operation because the resistance is already one kilo ohm or something like that. So adding a 100 ohm or 120 ohm here does not harm any of the operation but it will lower the peak current. So it's a good thing to do. What about the capacitance of this uh, capacitor? Let's assume first that we don't have a, a transistor, so there's no capacitance here. And what I need is to keep the voltage here during the time that there is no current. And let's assume 50% duty cycle, then half of the cycle, uh, this RC has to maintain the voltage. Now the for 100 kilohertz, we are talking about a period of uh, 10 microseconds. So let's say that the time constant that I want in order to have a reasonable ripple, not too high, is something like 100 microseconds. So if this is 100 microseconds, and we have decided on R sub G to be 100 kilo ohm, I find from the time constant that I need a one nanofarad. So we have found the value here, we found, we have selected R sub G, and we have found the value here, this was also chosen. So here is a simulation of the circuit. We have the 100 kilo ohm, one nanofarad, the two diodes, uh, well, this is a bit larger capacitor, and here it's a 100, and here it's a 100 ohm. So it's similar to what we have assumed. So here we have the input voltage, that is these pulses coming from this pulse generator. This is the current of the capacitor. We see here at the very beginning, we have a peak current and this is because uh, we are initially charging this capacitor from zero. And then we see here the voltage across the flying capacitor. And then we see also the output voltage and here the ripple as we have said, this is due to the fact that uh, this is the, the 100 microsecond uh, time constant. So now we have here the rise time and fall time. Let's have a look at the rise time. Here is the rise time. Again, since the current at the beginning is very high, rise time is pretty good in this case. We have about uh, 220 nanoseconds. That's in fact very good. However, the fall time is not that good because it the full time depends on the time constant of this uh, RC circuit. And it is about 150 microsecond. Uh, this is not the time constant. This is like from about 10% to 10%. So in many applications, this is okay because if they turn on and off is once in a while, that, that's okay. But there is a way to improve it. And I'm showing now a demo circuit uh, with a transistor, 
which includes the following. First of all, we have this stage here, as we've seen it before. We have the transistor, it's a high power transistor, and here the current source is 35 amp, 100 volt, 150 volt. We have the 100K, we have the one nano, but it really doesn't change much because the input capacitance is uh, larger than that. And then we have the two diodes, and we have here an active pull down arrangement with this PNP transistor, I'll talk about in a minute, and some time constant here, and this is again the same thing. Now also I have here a connection of a capacitor between, let's call it this ground here and this ground here, while the actual galvanic collection here is 100 mega ohm, so it's actually floating here and that the only connection is through this 22 nanofrag. Again, in many applications uh, you can have this capacitor. In some applications you cannot have it and then of course this approach is not uh, compatible with the requirement. So we can see the function of this capacitor when looking at the current through the on and off time of the input pulses. So during the on time, during the high level, we are charging this capacitor and we have a return path through here, which is okay. Otherwise, uh, without this capacitor, obviously there'd be no path for this current. And then during the off time, during the low level, we have the discharging of the capacitor again through this path. So this capacitor is very important if you do have a very large impedance between these uh, two grounds. Now, what about the active pull down here? The idea is to have a low impedance when looking at the emitter. When there is no drive here, we are left with this impedance and we, when we look at it through the emitter, we see an impedance, a reflected impedance, which is the original impedance over beta plus one, beta being the current gain of this transistor. So therefore, uh, during the off state, we see here a lower impedance, and this is 1K, assuming beta is 100, divided by 100, then of course the time constant is the same, so this is a 100 nanosecond. T time constant is the same, but impedance is lower. Now, of course, you don't want this pull down to happen every high frequency pulse. That is, if I look here back, there are high frequency pulses here, and of course there is a envelope, and I like to feed the gate with this envelope, so I need a holding capacitor here, but with a shorter time constant than the time constant here. So that from pulse to pulse, I will not pull this thing down to ground. So this time constant will determine the full time. So here are the simulation results. What we see here is again the input. We see the current of the flying capacitor. We see the voltage across the flying capacitor and we see the output voltage. You see that uh, the ripple now is lower because of the input capacitance of the transistor. Now what about the rise time and fall time? Now the rise time is pretty fast and the problem is primarily the fall time. So let's have a look now at the fall time. We see here the current of the transistor. This is now the transistor itself, okay? We're now looking at the transistor itself, which is of course the bottom line that we have to worry about. So we look at the current of the transistor and then we see the voltage going up and obviously there is a overlap because the fall time is uh, fairly long. So the product of this is power, of course. And here we see the power dissipation of this uh, transistor during this transition, the turn off. Now the time here is about uh, 10 microseconds and the peak power is 1.8 kilowatt. Well, it looks pretty bad, but it's really not. And the reason is 
that if you have a single pulse, and that's what we are talking about, then you have to talk about the transient thermal impedance, okay? That is the thermal resistance or impedance for short pulses. Now we are talking about a single pulse, and this pulse is about 11 uh, microseconds. Uh, actually, this is uh, 10 microseconds. We're talking about a single pulse. This is actually going even lower, but let's assume that this is the number. So this is 10 milli-degrees centigrade per watt. And if we have a peak of 1.8 kilowatt, then the delta T between junction and case is only 18 degrees centigrade. Now, one has to take into account that this is assuming that the case stays at a given temperature. Now, you cannot leave it in air because the thermal resistance between the case and air would be fairly large. What you need here is a relatively small heatsink just to have the thermal capacitance so the temperature of the case will not go up that much. Now look up my YouTube channel, there are some videos talking about thermal design. Now what about the pulse generator? One way to get the train of pulses is just by using a inverter with a hysteresis input, like a Schmitt trigger. And by this, the input will be between the two thresholds, so the capacitor will be charging and discharging, and then the output will be, of course, a square wave as you pass these thresholds. So this is a really a very simple way. And here the suggestion, this is just an example, perhaps it's an overkill because this is a, a gate driver with a quite a bit of high current capability at the output. So it'll be okay if you want to drive a number of transistors in parallel or if you like to have the rise time very quickly. So uh, this is capable of delivering quite a bit of current and probably uh, might be a overkill for some application. Nonetheless, this is just an example. So what we have here, this version here, 1.8, is an inverting uh, driver. And here is the resistor, here is the capacitor. The nice thing about it is that it has a enable terminal here so that you can turn the whole thing on and off when the uh, voltage here is low then there will be no pulses and as it will go up uh, you'll get the train of pulses and this is a digital level so this is very nice but of course there are many many other options so this brings me to the end of this uh, presentation i hope you have found it of interest and perhaps it will be useful to you in the future thank you very much